All right, what's going on everybody? In this video, we're gonna be talking about linear approximations and differentials, two topics which I thought were completely useless when I learned them in Calc 1, and now I use them almost all the time in my physics classes, so weird how that works. But anyways, let's get a rundown of what's gonna be going on in this video. So we're gonna start off here in this video by talking about linearization, okay? And that's gonna take up the first half of this video. We'll do three different examples of linearization, and then we'll move on to differentials, okay? We'll talk about what differentials are, how we use them, how they can also help us do linear approximations, and then we'll do another three examples, this time with differentials, okay? so. We'll be doing that. The timestamps are on the left. I have uh, a PDF in the description that's for uh, both unfinished and finished notes for this video. And uh, and yeah. Now before we get into this video, I do quickly want to mention my full Calculus One course, which I've linked in the description down below. In this course, I have plenty more practice problems to really get you feeling confident with each topic in Calc One. I also have full video explanations for every practice problem that we do in the course. So. Don't worry, you won't be left in the dust on anything. So if you're interested in that, be sure to check out the link in the description down below. Now let's get into this video. So we're gonna start out here with that introduction to linearization, okay? And so this is one of the methods that we can use for linear approximations, okay? And so the idea is sometimes we get gross functions where we know f of a, right? So we, we know this point, right? But it's going to be hard for us or impossible to find values of f that are directly around that point. Like maybe we, we want to find these y values or these y values, right? And so how do we do that? If it's, if it's you know, either like too hard and we, we don't want to and there's something easier or maybe it's impossible, what do we do? Well, what we can do is we can estimate these surrounding values by using a tangent line. Okay, and you can see the tangent line here, we call that y equals L of x, okay? So let me show you what I mean here, okay? We'll zoom in a little bit. So what I'm saying is, if we want to you know, find y values of this curve right here, right? Well, we can use, and let's say you know this curve is just described by a really nasty function that's just, just giving us, it's a big pain to deal with. What we can do is we can say, well, if we know f of a, right, we can approximate nearby values of x because look at the tangent line, right? If we find some point here, you know, and we, we want to find this guy, what, what the y value is at this point, look at the tangent line here, it's not that far off, right? At this, you know, at the same x line, right? Those two points are pretty close. Right, And so that is the idea with linear approximations. We're using this tangent line right, to approximate what this value is. Because again, they're really close to each other. Okay, And so it just makes it really nice for us. Now, of course, to use this tangent line, we need the equation for this tangent line. And again, we're calling this tangent line L of x here. Okay, and our original function that we're trying to find the value of is called f of x. Okay, and so here's the idea. Here's the scoop. You know, we've found equations for tangent lines before. This is something you've been doing ever since you started learning derivatives. We've been finding equations of tangent lines. What we've been doing is we've been given a curve like y equals x squared, right? We've taken a derivative on both sides. Let's say we wanted to find the tangent line at x equals 1 right? We'd find the point at x equals 1. We'd combine that with the slope at x equals 1, right? And then the slope and the points, right? Get Or the, the slope and the point, which is y and x, get plugged in to your y equals mx plus b equation, and that's how you find b, right? And then you can just plug in your m, plug in your b, and that is the equation of your tangent line. But now we're gonna do things just a little bit quicker, okay? And by that I mean, we're going to use an equation to find our tangent line, okay? It just, it organizes things, it makes things a little bit quicker. So let's dive into what this notation actually means, because I know that looking at this might get a little confusing for you. So 
what we have here is that the value of our function, right, f of x, we're talking about the y value of this function, is going to be about the same thing as the y value of the tangent line, right? And, and this is not always going to happen, right? If you look, like let's look down, like over here, right? You can see that here, there's a big difference, right, in y value, a, a lot bigger than the, the difference here, right? And so we need to be close to f of a to get a pretty accurate approximation, okay? And so it's about the same thing as the y value of the tangent line for nearby val values of x. And the, the actual equation for your tangent line is this guy right here, okay? Now, this is pretty similar to uh, y equals mx plus b. We'll talk about that in a second. But really what this equation is saying is, you know, you have your initial point. It's f of a for this problem, you know, f of a was somewhere over here, right? And so we're starting at this point. This slope right here, right, f prime of a is the slope of that original function at x equals a, that gives you the direction of your tangent line, right? That gives us the direction here, right? That's the slope. And x minus a is there to tell us, well, how far have we traveled away from the x coordinate a, right? If we know how far we've traveled away, then we can use the slope to find out what our new y value is, right? This is our first y value. Now what's our final y value? That is what this equation does. It gives us an initial point. We use the slope. It, it gives us the initial point we, and we use the slope combined with how far we are away from our original point to find what our new y value is, okay? And so that's essentially what y equals mx plus b does, right? Same idea, except that this whole thing kind of gets shifted over, right? And a is always on the uh, the y-axis, right? So that's, in, in, in this case, a is you know zero, right? So that's what's going on with this equation. Okay, and now we're just going to be applying it. But first, I do wanna talk a little bit about just a, a little bit more like, uh, I guess nomenclature is the right word, uh, how we name different things. So this tangent line, L of X, right? That's gonna be called the linearization of F at A, okay? So in finding this equation, or you're finding the equation of L of X in this scenario, what we have done is uh, we've found the linearization of F at A. That means we found this equation, okay? And so basically the reason why I'm saying that is because you often are asked in problems to find the linearization of F at A and what they mean when they say that is to find L of X to find the equation of your tangent line. So also what I wanted to talk about is that what we're doing here is called a linear approximation. Why is it called a linear approximation? Because we're using a line to approximate the Y value of another curve. Okay, so it's a approximation using a line. <laughs> That's how I would think about it. Now, an example of a linear approximation that I use pretty often in physics right now in my physics classes is the natural log of one plus X. Now, the natural log of one plus X, if you're, you know, you're looking at smaller values of X, maybe like, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, anything smaller is amazing. Uh, natural log of one plus X is about the same thing as X, right? And so what this means, right, is that natural log of one, right, plus we, we add on a little bit to one, maybe we add 0.3, whatever, right, it, it would be exactly the same thing as, as what we add on. That's what this entire natural log ends up being, right? It's pretty close, at least. 
And so the reason why this is really useful for us is because think about having to move around natural log of one plus X, take derivatives, do other calculus things that we'll worry about later in the course, like integrals. That's going to be really gross with natural log of one plus X, you know, especially when you get up into solving differential equations, not something we're going to talk about too much in this course. Uh, but it's going to be really gross to do something like that with natural log of one plus X versus just dealing with something like X, right? X is almost like the simplest thing you can deal with, right? And so that is why we do these approximations to really simplify things like natural log of one plus X, or even, I mean, we can go way, way more disgusting than natural log of one plus X, but hopefully you get the drift there. So we're actually going to do an example of exactly this. Now we're going to find the linearization of the function f of x equals natural log of one plus x at a equals zero, right? Again, what, what this entire thing is asking right here, it's asking for the linearization of this function, meaning it wants us to find the equation of the tangent line, right? And we want that so we can actually approximate uh, natural log of one plus x. Okay, so here we go. Let me show you exactly what's going on here. Uh, natural log of one plus X is going to look like this. Oh, not like, like this. There we are. Right. And what we're saying, we're at uh, a equals zero, right? And that's saying, okay, uh, you know, what is the values of X that we are, are talking about? Well, we're talking about values of X that are very, very small, right? We're, we're talking about values of X that are right around zero. And that's why we're kind of centering this approximation around zero. What A really means here is, you know, A is an X value, right? Because you plug A into this equation, right? As if it was a X value. That's exactly what A is doing here. But what we mean when we, when we say uh, that A equals zero, right? Is that we are drawing our tangent line and it's going to touch the curve at X equals zero, right? A is just so we don't get confused with uh, the different notations going on here, right? We'd have to have, cause we already have X's here. If we changed all these A's to X's, it, it would just get really gross and annoying. So hopefully you get what I'm talking about here. Okay. That is what A equals zero really means. Okay, that's where the tangent line intersects the curve. So let's get started here. Let's actually just use this formula. It's going to be pretty quick and painless. We want to find a couple things, f of a, f prime of a, and x minus a. So I'm going to write those out. I want to find f of a, right, which is, by the way, a is zero. So let's put that in there. We want to find f prime of a. To do that, we're going to need to find f prime of x first. We're also going to want to find F prime of a and X minus a, right? And we'll, uh, we'll get there when we get there. So F of zero is going to be natural log of one plus zero, right? Natural log of one plus X is going to be zero here. That's what we're plugging in. Natural log of one is zero. Okay. Now F prime of X is the derivative of this guy. How do you take a derivative of natural log of X? Well, that is one over X. Instead, we have a X plus one or a one plus X, however you want to say it. And so what ends up happening here is when we take that derivative and I should make this correct, the derivative of natural log of X equals one over X. If we have the derivative, of natural log of one plus X, we're just going to substitute this X with a X plus one. That's a chain rule, right? And the derivative of the inside of this piece, right? The, the one plus X, what's inside of the natural log is just one. And so this is our derivative. So we get that F prime of X is one over X plus one. Awesome. F prime of A, right? That is F prime of zero. 
because we know a is zero. So we're going to plug that into this guy. Okay, and when we do that, we just get one. Then we have x minus a. Again, we know a is zero, so we get x minus zero, and that is x. So plugging things in here, we get that L of x, right? When, we're, when we say we want to find the linearization, we're finding L of x, we're finding that tangent line. Write that a little neater. L of x is equal to f of a, f of a is zero, plus f prime of a, that's one, times x minus a is x. And so you see here that L of x is equal to x. And so what we've just saw is that, well, right around x equals zero, right around that line, okay, or well, right around this point on the natural log curve, So I'll draw this again. Right around this point, we can approximate the value of this curve natural log of one plus x using the equation x, right? We're using the equation y equals x, okay? The nearby values are going to be nearly identical. And so it's a great approximation. So that's one example of a linear approximation. Let's move on to problem two, where we're gonna do some more practice with this. Now we want to find the linear approximation of f of x equals the square root of x plus three at a equals one. And we wanna use this linearization to approximate the square root of 3.98 and the square root of 4.05. And we wanna label uh, uh, each of these approximations as either overestimates or underestimates We'll get into how to do that in a second. It's not going to be as bad as you might think. So we need our equation. And so I'm going to actually, I'm going to copy this down. Because I should have done that before I started recording, but who, what's whatever. <laughs> um, okay, that looks like it's about centered. And then we're going to change the color to yellow because we can't disgrace the yellow section with the color orange. So if we're finding that linear approximation, we're finding L of X, right? And we were given our A value, which is one. So let's start off here. We're going to start off by finding F of A, which is one here. F of one is going to be us plugging in one into F, right? And so we'll do that. We'll get square root of one plus three that is going to be the square root of four, which is two. And they, yeah. So then we're going to do f prime of x because we need to do find this guy in order to find f prime of a, which is one in this case. So f prime of x is gonna equal the derivative of x plus three. How do we take the derivative of this guy? Well, it actually should be pretty quick for you if you know the square root of x, when you take the derivative of this guy, it is one over two rad x. This is a derivative I really recommend that you remember because, well, it is, it's used a lot. You'll see derivatives of square roots a lot. And so knowing this guy is gonna be really nice. Now, if we're taking the derivative of this guy instead, I mean, really, it's going to be the same thing. You use chain rule, and so the x plus three goes where the x originally was. Now we multiply by the derivative of the inside here, but the derivative of x plus three is just one. So this is our entire derivative, okay? So we're going to plug that in. One over two square root of x plus three we can plug that in, that a value of one in to this f prime of x equation. And when we do that, we get one over two times the square root of one plus three, 
which is uh, 4. Why am I writing a 2? And that's going to give us 1 over 4, right? Because the square root of 4 is 2. Last thing, x minus a, we know that a is 1 here, and so this is x minus 1. So let's combine everything now to find our L of x. L of x is equal to f of a, which is 2, plus f prime of a, which is 1 fourth, and x minus a is x minus 1. And now we're going to clean this up a little bit because you'll notice, I mean, when we distribute this guy out, we're going to get a 1 fourth times a negative 1, so we're going to have to combine that with the 2. So L of x is going to equal 2 plus 1 fourth x minus 1 over 4. And in combining like terms here, we're going to get that, well, 2 is 8 over 4 minus 1 over 4 is 7 over 4. And then we add 1 over 4 x. Okay, awesome. And look what we have here, right? This is the equation of our tangent line, right? Our tangent line is L of x. And we know that this is approximately equal to F of x. Okay, and our goal here in this problem is to find the square root of 3.98 and the square root of 4.05. Let's do the square root of 3.98 first. Remember that F of x is the square root of x plus three, right? So if we do that, just write that down quick. We know now that this is approximately equal to 7 over 4 plus 1 over 4x. Okay? And so now what we can do is if we want to approximate the square root of 3.98, we need to figure out what value of x we're going to be plugging into our approximation. Well, what x would we have to add to 3 to get 3.98? Well, 0.98, right? So we can do f of 0 0.98 is equal to the square root of 3.98, which is approximately 7 over 4 plus 1 over 4 times 0 0.98. Right, just plugging in 0.98 for x. And here we get that this thing is equal to 1.995 after we put it into a calculator. Okay? That right there is our first answer for this problem. Now, if we want to approximate the square root of 4.05, then what does x have to be? Well, x to get, uh, well, to get, um, 4.05 from x plus 3, x would have to be 1.05. And so f of 1.05 is going to equal the square root of 4.05. And that's about equal to 7 over 4 plus 1 over 4. And then substituting in for x, 1.05. Put that in your calculator and you get that this is equal to 2.0125. All right. So you're probably wondering here, you're like, why don't I just plug this in my calculator? And yeah, you know, you're right. It's probably it's well, it definitely is a lot easier to just plug in square root of 3.98 into your calculator. And that's exactly what I was thinking. I was like, why not? You know, that why? <laughs> why would I have to do this? And so the answer to that is exactly what I was talking about earlier with the natural log of one plus X. It's going to be gross to take derivatives, move things around, it, it, things get really messy. The square root example is more simplified, if anything, but there are times where you need to simplify a really gross looking function or just a, ah, a weird function like natural log that you don't want to mess around with. And you can make things a lot easier on yourself. Okay. That is why we're doing this. Okay. We're transforming a square root into a line. Okay, and I think we can all agree that a line is much nicer than a square root. Okay, so it's it's kind of just practice for that end goal stuff. Okay, now let's move on to our last example with linearization, and then we'll move on to differential stuff. So now we have a little more of a, 
I guess, open problem. Like there's more possibilities, right? With example two, sorry, if you were trying to read that, <laughs> I probably just took that away from you. Um, with example two, we were given the function, we were given what A is, right? We were given, and we were given what we were trying to approximate. Here in example three, it says use a linear approximation to estimate 1.999 to the fourth power, right? Here, all we're given is what we're trying to estimate. We're not given the function and we're not given A. And so we need to figure that out. So before we even do that, I need to bring down this guy because I'm not trying to leave you guys hanging here. I'd like you guys to have something to look at. And just wait a second, there we go. <laughs> In due time, it will happen. All right, so we're gonna turn that to green. Can't disgrace the green section with yellow. And now we are going to start this problem. So the function that we can use here, right? And this is, it's gonna take a little bit of getting used to, but hopefully you can see it already. A good function to use here would be x to the fourth, right? Something to the fourth power, okay? If we had 1.999 to the third power, what would be a good function to use? Well x to the third power, right? And you can see here, what is 1.999 really close to? Well, it's close to two, right? And so that is gonna be our a. a is gonna be two. Uh, that looks, they look too close. Let me just, okay. Now that, now do they look different? My a's and my two's look really close, so I'm, I'm conscious of that. So, Remember what A's job is. A is where we are centering our approximation. It is where, let's just draw X to the fourth here. X to the fourth looks like this guy. It's a parabola, but it's like more fat. It's got like a double chin, right? And so with this guy, I can't remember what I'm saying because now I said the word double chin. Now, now that's all I can think about. Um, with this guy, our tangent line is going to be centered at x equals two, right? Because we want our approximation to be really close at this point. We want the values, uh, the y values to be extremely close right here. Okay, so that's why we have a equal to two. This is where our tangent line touches the curve. Awesome. So let's move on here. We have what a is, we have what f of x is, and we have our, uh, the thing we're trying to estimate. So we can actually move on and start plugging things into this equation. Well, I guess after we find them in the first place, right? So f of a is f of two, right? Because we know now that a is two. And f of two then, we just plug in two for the x to the fourth. We get two to the fourth, two to the fourth is 16. Okay, and then we can find f prime of x next. Same process every time, right? Now we can find f prime of x. Taking a derivative of x to the fourth, right? That's just power rule. That is four x to the third power. Then we can move on and plug in a, which is two. We'll plug in two to four x cubed. And when we do that, we get four times two cubed, which when I was doing this uh, at first, I thought of this thing as being a two to the fifth power because you know that four is two to the second. And uh, I don't think that's any faster than how you're probably thinking about it, but <laughs> I just, I don't know. I don't know why I had to go and talk about that. <laughs> so f prime of two is 32. And then x minus a is x minus two. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna write that like this. All right, cool. So now we're going to plug into this guy. We get that f of x is approximately equal to our L of x equation. And that is f of a, which is f of two, right? Because a is our two, uh, yeah, a is our two here. Two is our a here. <laughs> So we, that we get 16 plus f prime of two is 32. 
and then x minus a, that's x minus 2. Now let's distribute and simplify here. We get 16 plus 32x minus 64. Just distribute that 32 through. Then we're going to combine like terms. We get 32x. If you, sub if you uh, subtract 64 from 16, right? Same thing as 64 minus 16 with a negative sign. That's negative 48. Okay, that is our line tangent to the curve at x equals 2. All right, so now what do we do with this equation? Well, we're going to plug in what x is here. We have the equation of x to the fourth. x is 1.999 here. And so in doing that, we get that f of 1.999 is approximately equal to 1.999 plugged in our tangent line, which is 32 times 1.999 minus 48. And doing that in your calculator, you get 15.968. And that right there is your answer. Okay, we've now used this tangent line centered at x equals 2 to find a nearby value of x, right? Or to find the, the y value of the function at a nearby value of x. Okay, that's all this was. So that was it for linearization. I know it's uh, pretty different than some of the stuff that you're used to. Right, but uh, but yeah, that's that. Let's move on to differentials. Just real quick before we head into differentials, uh, if you're not subscribed to the channel already, make sure you do subscribe because I have plenty of videos for Calc 1 for you to watch, as well as I'm gonna be posting plenty more Calc 2, Calc 3, linear algebra, differential equations, all that stuff that you're gonna need for the future if you choose to continue taking math classes or continue being forced to take math classes, all right? so. Definitely subscribe. Anyways, let's get on to this here. Uh, basically, another way that we can do these linear approximations is by using these things called differentials. I'll talk about what those are in just a second. Okay, first, I want you to see something here. Let's ignore the tangent line in this graph down here. Let's look at y equals f of x. Okay, y equals f of x. If we start out at this point here, Okay, and we want to find some other point, right? Let's talk about this point right here. Okay, we need to go over by some delta x, right? And then that would uh, correspond to some change in y, right? And that would get us to our point. Or it it kind of looks like, like slope in a way, right? Rise over run, and that's exactly what it is. Okay, now if I actually write an equation for this guy, right? I would say that, okay, well, to find our change in y, right, to find that guy, given our change in x, this would be equal to, well, the y value of our function after we've moved that delta x, right, minus this y value, right, you know, that's the exact distance of delta y, it's the difference in these two y values, okay? Now the y value here, if we call this guy x and we call this guy x plus delta x then this equation is relatively straightforward i hope <laughs> delta y would be f of x plus delta x right that's the y value here minus f of x okay now i know that it's kind of weird to see x marked off as an actual coordinate here um you know you might be you might want to see it as like a right and then a plus delta x right just because you know you want to plug something in for x right and and that's i feel like what's more natural to me it might hope i mean it might be more natural to you i'm not exactly sure but i don't know it just feels right to me to do that instead and so if we did that our equation would become delta y equals f of a plus delta x minus f of a 
And maybe that would seem, uh, again, a little more natural to you than this guy. All right. But that is our first equation here. All right. And I'm going to mark that in, uh, I guess, cyan. I don't know. I'm going to call this like, I don't know exactly what to call this color. I'm going to call it aqua. It's not like, well, no, it's not aqua. It's like, all right, never mind. So um, <laughs> anyways, let's also talk about we're going to bring in this tangent line now. Okay. So this equation gives us the actual change in Y, but if we want to approximate the change in Y, well, we can do that using the tangent line. Now we know that Y, sorry about the dogs, the Y is equal to uh, that function of X, right? We're given that right here. <clears throat> now, if you take a derivative on both sides, you get the DY over DX is equal to F prime of X, right? And we know that these two forms of notation are exactly equal, right? They're the same exact thing. So what we can do now to get our differentials is we're going to multiply by DX on both sides. Okay, and then we get this equation, but in a different form. And that form is that DY equals F prime of X times DX. And here's where it helps to visualize this thing as being A here. If you actually plug in a for X here, right, it'll become a, a little more clear of what's going on. We could find the slope of our tangent line, right? That's exactly what, right? That's the instantaneous slope of this curve at X equals a, right? And it would of course be the slope of the line tangent to that point or to the curve at that point, right? And so that slope ends up being constant, right? Because obviously like the slope for a specific value is just going to be a number like three, four, two, <laughs> okay? And so why does this help us? Well, what we can do using this is we can say, all right, well, let's go over by that amount delta X, right? Let's, let's take this guy and we're going to go over by dx and all right we're going to go over by dx here and these lines are supposed to be on top of each other right here the blue and the green i just didn't want to draw like that because i figured that would be annoying for you but uh then if we want to go up here we'd be going up a distance dy okay and again you know we know that that slope is F prime of A, right? It's the slope of the tangent line, right? That's going to stay as it is. Okay. Now that DY is going to be, well, a lot, that's going to be our approximation for Delta Y, right? The reason why we're going to use DY instead of Delta Y is because again, often it can be really gross to plug into this function, do all that garbage, right? This is going to be a lot simpler because to find DY, you need the, well, the slope at that point, right? And then you just need, and it's the slope of the tangent line, which the tangent line is going to end up being a lot easier to deal with. And then uh, DX, right? How far you're going over. Okay. So it's a little bit nicer. Now, what th this approximation looks pretty far off right now, doesn't it? I mean, del del delta Y is this, DY is this guy. And it looks like DY is about twice delta Y's size. But start getting closer, start shrinking down delta X or DX, right? They're the same exact thing. Uh, just shrink them down and you will start seeing that, you know, we look at this point right here, there's not much of a difference in delta Y uh, compared to DY, right? And so as we get closer, as delta X approaches zero, DY is going to become the same thing as delta Y, all right? And so, this it, this is going to be great for our approximation. So I have it written out here. So for small changes in X, right? So, you know, for small changes, like we know this func, we know this value right here. We're looking for values that are right around it, right? For those small changes in X, we can again use the tangent line and we're gonna use that to approximate the new value of Y. And again, these are called linear approximations. Okay, so hopefully I didn't make that uh, 
you know, hopefully I didn't make that too confusing for you. I mean, it is kind of uh, weird to, to visualize and hopefully I was able to help you do that. But really what's going on here is we're just using the tangent line to approximate the nearby values of y, just like we were before with linearization. So we're gonna move on to an example here. This example is going to be uh, pretty nice, I promise, all right? This example says find the differential of y equals x e to the negative 4x. Now when we are asked to find the differential, what that means is just find dy, right? That's the differential we're referring to. And actually, I should have mentioned that, right? Delta y or dy and dx, those are called differentials. That's a, that's a great thing. I'm glad I was able to uh, finally remember to bring that up, right? We call these things differentials when they are by themselves like that, okay? And so when it says in this problem, find the differential, it really, when, when people say find the differential and they don't specify which one, dy or dx, what they mean is to find dy. Okay, that's that's what they're saying here. And so what we need to do here, we just take this derivative, we find dy over dx, right? As you can see here, this is going to be a bit of product rule. And then to take this derivative here, that's chain rule. And then all we have to do once we have that blah, blah, blah derivative, we just take the dx and we move it over here by multiplying it on both sides. And then we have dy. So it's basically just taking a derivative and then multiplying. <laughs> That's it. So if we want to take this derivative here, this is a little bit of review for you guys. Okay. First, we see that we have a product rule here. Okay. So we'll start by taking the derivative of this first piece, x, and then we'll multiply by e to the negative 4x. Okay. The derivative of x is 1, and so we're just left with a e to the negative 4x here. Now we're going to add this to our second piece, right? And our second piece would be the derivative of e to the negative 4x times x. So we'll put the x in here. Now what's the derivative of e to the negative 4x? Well, we know the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? And so the derivative of e to the negative 4x, we're gonna leave the negative 4x alone. But as a consequence of being able to leave that guy alone, we need to multiply by the derivative of that thing that we've left alone. Okay, in the derivative of negative 4x, right, that's what this d over dx means, right? The derivative of negative 4x is just negative 4, right? And so the derivative of e to the negative 4x is going to be negative 4 times e to the negative 4x. And then just simplifying this a little bit here, we get the dy over dx is equal to uh, e to the negative 4x. We can multiply that x through to get minus 4x e to the negative 4x. All right. And what a lot of uh, professors or teachers like to do when they see uh, both exponentials here, they like to just yank that out and write this as dy over dx as e to the negative 4x times Right, if you take out an e to the negative 4x here, you get a one. If you take out it, the e to the negative 4x here, you're left with the minus 4x, right? And you can be the judge of whether you like this better or this better. I really don't care. I generally leave it like this just because it's less work, but um, yeah. So to solve for dy here, all we have to do is multiply that dx over. And we finally get that dy is equal to e to the negative 4x times 1 minus 4x times dx. And that right there is the answer to your first problem with differentials. Okay, so really same process here as just taking a derivative. All we do at the end is we multiply the dx over and that gives us dy. All right, simple as that. We're going to do that in the next two examples, but now we're just gonna add some more stuff on top of it, okay? So for example five, okay, we have that y is the square root of three plus x squared, and we wanna find dy, and we wanna evaluate it at x equals one, and dx equals negative 0.1, okay? 
So now we're just going to find dy again, just like we did, right? Taking a derivative, multiplying the dx over, and then we're going to plug in x equals one. Okay, we're gonna plug in dx equals negative 0.1 because at the end we're gonna have dy equals blah, 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 and that blah, blah, blah is gonna have x's and dx's in it, right? And so we just plug in the x, we plug in the dx in on this side. Wow, that was a really good oval. Wow, I'm really, guys, ooh, wow. I'm just gonna take a second, that was really nice. Anyways, <laughs> um, oh my God, all right done with it done with it um what was i saying so i'm so i'm so like all right anyways so we have the x equals one we have the dx equals negative 0.1 we're going to plug those in and that's going to give us dy okay that's going to give us again dy is our approximation right if we go back up to the top here we know that dy is the change in y from the initial point to our tangent line right the the new y value of our tangent line sum delta x over okay and so that's what we're trying to find here it's not the actual change in y of the curve but it's the approximation okay so let's go ahead and just go through this process it's not going to take too long here the hardest part of this entire thing is taking derivatives and so it really tests you to make sure that you still know how to take derivatives okay dy over dx is going to be, well, you see that we have a square root here. And again, we talked about this derivative in the beginning of this video. Uh, the derivative of the square root of x is one over two rad x. That's a great derivative to memorize, okay? And so what we do is we write rad x. If we don't have rad x, we have like rad three plus x squared. We do the same thing. The radical still goes in the denominator with the two. We leave the three plus x squared alone, but as a consequence of being able to leave that three plus x squared alone, we multiply by the derivative of that thing we left alone, the three plus x squared. The derivative of three plus x squared is two x, right? And so we can write that the derivative here is one over two times the square root of three plus x squared times 2x and that looks really gross so what i'm going to do here is i want to sh i don't want to erase my work because especially if you're viewing the pdfs later on i don't want to like be like all right yeah well you missed out i did it in the video like no i want to give you guys the actual work so i'm just gonna do that and then i'm gonna fix this because it looks gross there we are all right, and this, I mean, it still doesn't look much better, but that's fine. So we see here that the twos cancel off, right? And then we're left with a X over the square root here. We can also move the DX over, we might as well. And we get the DY equals one over, actually not one over, we'll say X over the square root of three plus X squared, right? That's just simplifying the side. And then we have the DX on the end. Okay, so now exactly like we were talking about, we have the dy is equal to something with x's and dx's in it. Okay, and well, first off, it, it asks us to find for dy here. So we, since we did that, I'm going to circle this guy. But wow, and I completed that again. Look at that. Wow. I'm impressed. I'm doing well tonight. But, uh, but yeah, so what we're going to do now is we're going to plug in the x, x is one. And we're gonna plug in dx, dx is negative 0.1. Now, we know that dy is gonna be one over, this is a four, so square root of four is two. And then we have one half times negative 0.1. Now, what we, I mean, there's, there's two ways we could go here. We could either convert this fraction to a decimal or convert the decimal to a fraction, right? And I think a lot of people would rather see the decimal as a fraction, right? Because it's just a lot nicer to look at fractions. Uh, it's, I don't know, 
just that's what you've been dealing with, right? Like pretty much all of all in algebra and all that, you deal with fractions a lot more than you deal with decimals. But uh, we were given our dx as a decimal, and so I think we should give them our dy in a decimal as well. And so I'm going to write this one half as a 0.5. Well, honestly, you don't even need to do that. You could say one half of, of negative 0.1 already if you know that. Um, but I'm going to write my dy as a decimal. Okay. So that's a little bit quicker. All right. So dy is negative 0 0.05. That is exactly what we were asked for here. We wanted to find dy at first, right? We did that just taking a derivative, moving the dx over, and then we just plugged in x equals one and the dx. So now we're going to move on to our final example for this video here. And again, it's just gonna be the same idea. This time it's going to be a little, a little bit more than uh, we have been doing because now we're going to find delta y, okay? On top of finding dy and here we're given that y equals x squared minus 4x, we're given that x equals 3, and we're given that delta x is 0.5. Okay? So, first off, I mean, we know how to find dy, right? We've been doing that. And so, if you want to start off doing that, we can. Right? We know that since y equals x squared minus 4x, the derivative here will just be power rule, right? A derivative here would be 2x minus 4. All right, hopefully these derivatives are starting to get a little bit faster for you. I mean, they don't have to be like supersonic speed yet, but if you're picking up the pace, if you're, you know, you notice that you're starting to pick up the pace with these derivatives, that's a really good sign, okay? So that's your dy over dx. To find dy, we just multiply by that dx over, right? We get that dy is equal to 2x minus four times dx, Okay, and we can find what dy is by plugging in x. And remember that delta x is the same thing as dx, right? So if they give you delta x, you know that dx is the same thing. Remember, I showed you that here, right? dx is the same thing as delta x. Okay, uh, we go over by the same amount in x and we just see how our approximation height uh, differs from our actual change in height. Okay. So we know that x is 3 and dx is 0.5. And so dy is going to equal 2 times 3 is 6 minus 4 is 2. 2 times 0.5 is 1. Okay. And so now we have the first part of this problem. The second part, we're trying to find delta y here. All right. And remember our equation for delta y. Delta y is equal to f of x plus delta x minus f of x. And yes, we're going to have to actually use this equation here. Okay. But it's not going to be as bad as you would think. I know that people get skittish seeing the x plus delta x. It's not going to be too bad here. We know that x is 3. Delta x is 0.5. And again, x is 3. Okay, just plug it in there. Now, if we add these up, we get that delta y is going to be f of 3.5 minus f of 3. And that should make sense to you, right? We're moving by 0.5 in the x direction. And to find the y value, right, to find the, well, to find the change in the y value, right, we need to, let's say that this uh, curve looks like this guy right here, right? And let's say that this is x equals 3 and this is x equals 3.5, right? To find this change in y, we need to take the y value here and subtract the y value here, right? And that gives us this guy. It gives us the y value in between, the change in y, okay? And so let's just plug that into our equation here, right? Uh, f of 3.5 is going to be 3.5 squared minus four times 3.5. If you're curious where I'm getting that from, right? Just this equation here, plug it in. And then we're going to subtract f of three, which is gonna be three squared minus four times three. Okay. 
and I'm going to move these guys over here because um, I just want to get that last parentheses in. Okay. So if you put this all into your calculator here, remember to distribute that negative. You don't want any uh, silly calculator errors, but uh, you can put that all in. You get the Delta Y is 1.25. Okay. And there you go. All right. And so that's some uh, quick practice with differentials here. Okay, nothing too crazy. I just wanted you to really get the hang of all these delta y's, dy's, all this stuff being thrown around. Because if you're comfortable with that, when the derivatives start to get a little messier, right, that's just going to be brushing up on taking derivatives. That's really the only thing that could make these hard is when you get tougher derivatives. Okay. One last thing with this problem, though. Notice how you know, dy and delta y, they're not that far off, right? They're like 0.25 off, right? That's the, the actual change in y for this function is uh, 1.25. We only approximated that the change in y would be one, okay? And actually, as a full review of what the heck is going on here, we are looking at this equation, y equals x squared minus four x at x equals three. That is the point where our intersection is occurring, right? That's where this point is is, is uh, for our problem. That's where the tangent line is intersecting the curve, right? It's, it's where, well, it, put another way, it's the point that we're looking at on our curve, right? And we draw a tangent line that's tangent to the curve at that point, right? And so that's why, you know, the tangent line's intersecting the, the function, okay? That right there, is three for us. Okay, that's x equals three. And the delta x, how far we're going over is 0.5. Okay, and then from there, we're trying to see, well, how much are we going up in the y direction? Well, we found that that's actually 1.25. And well, we estimated from our tangent line that it would be one. Okay. And so these values are pretty close. They're not exact, right? I mean, that should be expected because as you, I mean, first off, our delta X is pretty big, 0.5, right? That's fairly large. That's when you start to really see some differences. But again, that's all, I guess that's all subjective depending on what the case is. But even with a parabola, I mean, this is not the parabola we're dealing with because we have the minus four X that's gonna shift the parabola over. But, you know, if you're away from our parabola's center or the vertex a little bit, I mean, you really start to see big changes um, in, in the Y, right? I mean, you're talking about uh, increasing, um, like the change in increases a lot because this X is being squared, right? And so it's very easy to start getting uh, approximations that are like less and less accurate, okay? So I don't know. I just figured that would be some good stuff in case you actually care about that. But uh, anyways, that is linear approximations uh, using linearization, differentials. It's stuff that you'll definitely have to worry about later on in math and physics if that's what you consider doing. If not, congratulations, you just, you've just learned some more calculus, I guess, all right? But anyways, that's gonna do it for this video. Definitely check out that full Calc 1 course in the description down below if you're interested in doing more practice problems. But yeah, guys, I hope this video helped and uh, I'll see you soon.